Hello, welcome back to the Metaphobia Free podcast. We are joined today by Lisa Onaproy, who is a newly qualified Thrive Program coach based in the Netherlands. And we're really excited to have Lisa here with us, who she has got a really interesting story to tell about emetophobia, but also anxiety and depression that she has lived with. So I'm going to hand straight over to you, Lisa. Do you want to tell us your story from the beginning? That's a big job, isn't it? I apologize. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Well, thanks for having me, by the way. Um, so about my story. Yes, it's a bit of a longer story um, because I have to go back 11 years because I okay. created the metaphobia when I was 15 um, after my brother got sick. And I actually remember um, he got sick and I heard him being sick. And for some reason, because I didn't know what, what, what was going on, I created a lot of panic and anxiety. And I remember standing in the corner of my room, you know, shaking like a leaf. And I didn't know what was going on because, you know, yeah. I was 15. I never created a panic attack. So that was difficult for me. And mm-hmm. um, after that, I just remember um, creating a lot of anxiety about being sick um, yeah. all the time. And actually, the day after that, I remember actually being sick. And I just I was just shaking like a leaf in my bed all, like just waiting for it to be over and it was a pretty horrible experience for me uh back in the day and it was all new to me which is kind of yeah. frightening especially when you're a kid you're basically a kid when you're 15 so yeah. um i remember after that period of time i just worried about being sick a lot of the time and also created a lot of um physical symptoms i was nauseous or i thought i was nauseous a lot of the time yeah which you know, we know for metaphobes they can feel ill a lot of the time a lot without of the time. actually being ill so um that was pretty much the start of my metaphobia journey in a way so i struggled with it for um two years until i figured out what it was i think i, rem- I went on google and searched uh like emetophobia no i think i searched um a fear of being sick and then i found out it actually had a name mm. so i uh, found uh, or i searched for cures and then i came across the thrive program yeah and i remember reaching out to I don't know who it was, but I remember reaching out via Facebook. And then I actually got myself a book. And again, I was 17. So you're young, but I really worked hard on it. on going through the book. And um, I pretty much got myself over the emetophobia. Yes. I remember, uh, I think the best example I could give was when my mom actually was sick. Um, and I was standing like six feet away from her or something. And I didn't yeah. even flinch. Like I Perfect. just stood there calm and relaxed and I was like okay but this is new this is different because I've been living with this phobia for two years and to explain a little bit about you know how severe it was um I remember whenever my brother got sick I would just run away like I I would literally run away I remember whilst my mom got ill I was wearing a this this was pre-covid obviously so I was wearing like winter gloves and a scarf around my face just to get the bacteria away yeah <laughs> it was it was really bad yeah. and um so having that experience of being near someone who was being sick and just being calm and relaxed about it it was yeah, very really. exciting and very new yeah so yeah that was more of the beginning of my story right <laughs> anyway. okay yeah so that was you did that in you got the book when you were 17 and you overcame it in 17, yeah, 17. so in two years right okay now yeah. i don't know anything about your story i sort of said that at the beginning <clears throat> All I know is you believed you were emetophobic for many years after that, even though you'd overcome yeah. it. So I think that's a really interesting avenue to go down because I think that's quite a common thing um, to really understand what emetophobia is and therefore to know when you've overcome well, when you've overcame it. So yeah. you were able to stand your mum be and say you were calm, relaxed about it, but you still believed you had a metaphobia. Why do you think that was? Um, I think because I was still creating some anxiety or some thoughts about being sick uh-huh. and because I used to be a perfectionist, um, you perceive that as failure and you perceive it mm-hmm. as, oh, I have some thoughts from time to time and I've created some anxiety from time to time. So it means that the, the metaphobia is still there and it's not working and I yeah. have to work on this a lot more. And I Absolutely. think that that's exactly what kept me, kept me trapped for all those Years because if you keep telling yourself you're the metaphobe and I say over oh, metaphobia, it's not good enough. You're maintaining the beliefs, you're maintaining the the fear of being sick. I wouldn't call it metaphobia at this point, but it was definitely more of a fear, really strong dislike of being sick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think um, the way I thought about it now is um, about a year ago I went to get my wisdom teeth uh, removed. Yes. It was the first time I had that done. I never had an anest- uh, aesthetic. Yes. Or anything. So I went there and I created a bit of anxiety. I mean, it's the first time I've done that 
So, but I was fine. And um, but I wouldn't say to myself, you know, I have a fear of the dentist or I have a phobia of the dentist. So I think that that's the kind of example I can give. You know, I, at this point, I would never say, you know, I have a fear of being sick or a phobia of being sick. No. Just like I wouldn't say I have a fear of the dentist. I just don't, I just like, don't really it. like going to the dentist. Absolutely. Same with being sick. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Really great example and quite strange because that was the example that I was going to use <laughs> as well. Uh, <laughs> really? So I'm going to think of it. Yeah, genuinely, my example was going to be going for fillings and having um, anesthetic in your gums, you know, the needle in your gums. That's exactly what I was going to say. Um, but let's give a different example. So when I was uh, as a teacher before I was a Thrive coach and I used to take the kids on a, on a residential or be part of a residential every year. And there was the high ropes uh, in the UK. There's something called Go Ape, but it's basically an assault course in the air. So you're climbing over bridges and hooking yourself on and off of ropes. And, you know, it's 30 foot in the air or whatever else. And every year I would shake when I was doing it and I'd be going oh okay and I'd, I'd have to have my game face on and I'd be going come on kids you're fine because obviously there was children there that were scared and they wanted to go on the high yeah. ropes and I was going see you're absolutely fine you can do it all the, all the while going Michelle you can do it you're okay right <laughs> and, and coaching myself yeah. through it now I did not have a fear particularly or a phobia of the high ropes and I went and did it every year but I didn't like it it wasn't my favorite yeah. thing my thoughts around it were unhelpful so if you're at the point, if you're listening to this podcast and you're at the point where you're thinking, well, I'm not avoiding it. You know, if I have to go to the dentist, I'm going to go to the dentist. If I've got to go and do the high ropes, I'm going to go and do the high ropes. But I don't have to like it. And I can have some unhelpful thoughts about it as if, oh, this is horrible. I don't like this or whatever else. That's not a metaphobia. That's just a dislike of something. And that's completely fine. Yeah. 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 Which I think is a, a, a really good point to get across. Really, really good. Lovely. So. Fast forward then, because you hadn't really nailed your thinking styles, particularly your perfectionism and possibly some of your limiting beliefs, moving forward yeah. in your story, the little bit I do know is that you went on to create anxiety and depression later on. Do you want to tell yeah. part of your story? Yeah, so um, I was doing okay for all those years and then in the end of 2020, I created um, a lot of anxiety. I was maybe call it like an anxiety disorder. <clears throat> And I, um, because I, and I also created depression on top of that. Yeah. And I found myself at the point where I couldn't even leave my house. And if I did, you know, it would be very anxiety provoking. Um, yeah. I would just be in bed all day, um, did nothing all day. If I did do something, I would enjoy anything. Everything scared me. Everything was mm -hmm. frightening. And I just created a lot of anxiety every single day and every single moment of every single day. Yeah. So, um, that was probably the worst moments over the worst moments of my life. Mm -hmm. But then I fell back and I thought, you know, um, maybe I should do the Thrive Pro program again. Yeah. Because this isn't just not working. I need to get over this. And that's the point where I um, found my coach. And I went to the program with a coach, which I had never done before. Uh -huh. And then I got myself over, you know, the anxiety, depression. And I will say when I was in that, you know, very bad mental state, um, I did create a stronger dislike of being sick. I mean... Mm -hmm. It makes sense, you know, if your mental health is that bad and your thinking is all over the place and you're creating a lot of anxiety generally, it makes sense to create some, or to create some, to, to, for your metaphobia to get a bit worse or your Absolutely. Sort of dislike of being sick to get a bit worse. But I got myself over all of those things and um, now I'm a Thrive Coach, so it's, yes. it's very exciting. <laughs> yeah, but very it, exciting. it's an important um, um, topic to talk about, I think, because when I went through the program at 17, Mm -hmm. um, I just focused on getting over my metaphobia and not specifically right. on thriving. Right. And for me, that's really important because now I can clearly see, you know, if you focus on thriving, which I did, um, it's very different because you, you feel strong and powerful, generally speaking, in life. So you don't create any other mental health symptoms. The whole point of the program is to get you over your metaphobia. But actually, ultimately, your metaphobia is a symptom of not thriving. So we yeah. don't actually focus it an awful lot, as you well know, on safety seeking and avoidance behaviours when we're going through the programme. We focus on thriving, your day-to-day -day life. What are you thinking when you are going shopping? What are, what are your thoughts like when you are going to school or to work or yeah. when you're driving? We need to have good, solid mental health across the board to be thriving in all areas of life so that when we meet a challenge dentist <laughs> being sick high ropes whatever it might be we have the ability to cope with that and we know how to cope with that and that comes with a thriving skill set 
And yeah. I think I've, I, I can speak from personal experience, but I think it was another um, coach that I was speaking to. And he said, you know, I got over my emetophobia. I, I paid my money almost to get over emetophobia. But what I didn't bank on was getting the whole new life that I got because yeah. it, it yeah. Which it is, right? So, and and you possibly more than most, if you've created anxiety and depression on top of the emetophobia, know that that's the case. Because if I could ask you now, then if you believe that you would ever recreate anxiety or depression or emetophobia or any other mental health symptom, what would your mm-hmm. response be? Um, if I did create it, um, I would feel powerful and relaxed and ab- uh, able to overcome those things and manage my thinking well. Yeah. And just move on with my life. And it, I think the most important bit in, in that kind of stuff is that it's not happening to me, which is, you know, the, the main message that we have, you know, emetophobia is not happening to you. Yes. Anxiety and depression don't happen to you. And because I have that belief and I know I'm powerful in that way, um, yes. it's very easy for me to deal with stuff like that. Absolutely. Yeah. And I guess you can you have the skill set because this is a training program and you get skills and things that you can actively do. Like, I want to say you can put your tangible things, but they are tangible things, aren't they? This is exactly what set it out. ABC, this is what we want you to do to get yourself, you know, higher self-esteem or lower your social anxiety. You know exactly how to create high self-esteem. You know exactly how to create high social anxiety. You know exactly how to manage catastrophic thoughts or perfectionist thoughts. So if you have that skill set, the energy you need to put in is into applying it because you know exactly what to do not to create a mental health symptom. Yeah. So if yeah. you know what to do, then why would you do it ultimately? Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's all, yeah. it's all the education, isn't it? It's the education around understanding yeah. your own mind and therefore being able to apply those things and create, be in the driver's seat of your own life, create solid mental health for yourself across yeah. the board. Great. Yeah, okay. Exactly. So what does life look like for you now? Because at one stage you, were, you weren't able to go out or get out of bed. What's life yeah. like for Lisanna now? Mm-hmm. Well, life is great now. Um, I, well, I'm a Thrive Coach now. I have my normal social work job. I like going out for dinner, which is, again, as an ex It's always yes. a special thing to do, right? Uh, yes. Going for dinner. I like going on city trips. Um, I live a very happy, nice, normal, anxiety, depression, and emoti- metaphobia free life. Perfect. Lovely. Okay. Yeah. What advice would you give to anybody out there who is suffering with anxiety depression or emetophobia um well first of all i think go through the the thrive program obviously Mm -hmm. but i think the reason i say that because you know um in thrive we focus on thriving so you don't have to um focus on the um um, separate mental health symptoms all the time you could get everything in one go and yes. that's really important because sometimes I have people ask me, you know, um, aren't you afraid that the anxiety or depression or whatever will come back? And I say mm-hmm. to them, you know, I'm not afraid that it come back because I know I created it and I feel very powerful and able to yes. manage my thinking and create happy, you know, lovely uh, emotions and feelings. So I'm not afraid of anything. Yes. I think that that's the most important thing to um, really work hard and go through the program so you can get to, so you can learn how to thrive and not just overcome symptoms and feel a bit better because that, that's no good when yeah. you get really thriving it's always easy to to um create great mental health mm. so i think that that's the most important thing. focus on thriving no focus on just getting a bit better that's that's yes. no good yes perfect yeah. i was having a, a lovely discussion with a client yesterday actually um who was saying about being resilient and using that word resilient and she was saying well you know i <clears throat> i can you know do these things now that i wasn't able to do but I find it really difficult and I know I've got to pick myself back up and really, you know, power through and charge through it and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, she was kind of insinuating that she was happy with that. And it was sort of like, well, I can do it, but I find it really, really hard work. And my point to her was resilient is good, but it's not what we want to be. We want to be far past resilient. We want to be thriving. So you've got, if you have a continuum, I'm showing my sort of hands here on screen, right? Got a continuum of poor mental health, not thriving. You've then got part way across this continuum, resilient. So I can do these things. I can push myself out of my comfort zone, but I find it really hard. I get knocked down. I have to pick myself back up and I struggle and I suffer through it. People with, with high functioning emetophobia may feel that way where they, you know, they may have a job 
in a primary school or whatever else it might be. And every day is a slog, but they still do it. So that's a, that's a resilient person. Thriving is not resilient. Thriving is this end of the continuum where actually you're not get constantly getting knocked down to have to pick yourself back up again. You're not spending your life getting yourself worked up, getting yourself into an anxious state to then have to calm yourself down. You have the tools not to get yourself into that anxious state in the first place. Yeah. And therefore life feels free and liberating and easy most of the time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think people watching this who haven't been through the program may be going, well, it sounds all sunshine and rainbows and toxic positivity. <clears throat> and that's absolutely not what this is. Okay, there's there's no toxic mm. positivity to it at all because some parts of life are horrible. And if I wasn't on a podcast, I would use stronger language, right? But they're awful and there's no way of getting round, yeah. you know, the death of a loved one or um, some trauma of some description. Those things are awful. But part of this program is to accept how bad that situation is, accept it for what it is, not sugarcoat it, not pretend everything's fine and pretend that you're finding it easy, accept how bad it is, but have the, the resolute belief in yourself that you will get through it. Yeah. And that you will cope. <clears throat> if you mentioned the death of a loved one, a friend mm -hmm. of mine passed away a couple of years ago. There we go. And I remember right. actually back in the day, I used to think, you know, I couldn't cope with that. I couldn't tolerate that. And when it actually happened, I mean, it was it was awful. Like it really awful. was. It was awful and it was sad. But yeah. I coped with it really well. Yes. And I just allowed myself to be sad and, you know, this too shall pass. It kind of, that kind of attitude. Yes. So I really dealt with that differently. Um, and also, uh, you know, building my business and becoming a Thrive Coach, which is a... Yes really exciting, but also it can be difficult, you know, figuring yeah. everything out and building your business. And um, yeah. I think years ago, because I wanted to be a Thrive Coach for a very, very long time, and I just didn't um, have the resources or didn't have the self-belief that I could do it. Yeah. But now, um, because I'm thriving, it was a very nice experience. And the moments of that were a bit more tough. You know, I coped with it and I said to myself, you know, I will be fine. I'll figure yes. it out. I'll manage everything. This will be okay. Perfect. So again, the scoping skills are really, really important. Yes, perfect. So that's how we deal with um, difficult situation. I just accept that, you know, this is the more difficult situation. Again, I'm not I'm not being falsely positive and being like, oh, everything is fine, everything is amazing. That's that's right. not what life is, right? No. Nope. Yeah. But I just accept the reality of the situation and I tell myself yep. I will cope and I will yes. find a way around it and I'll be all yep. okay. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Hundred yeah. percent. And slightly along the same tangent there, um, again I was talking to a lovely lady yesterday. And she was saying, she's talking about a daughter who's got a metaphobia. <clears throat> and she said, once you've been through the program, is it then just a case of going and exposing yourself to really tricky situations that you wouldn't have been able to do before to prove to yourself that you can do them? <clears throat> and my answer was, not necessarily. What you don't want to do, what you don't need to do is go and, I don't know, make put yourself in where people are actively being sick to prove to yourself that you're over a metaphobia because once you've got the belief that you can cope then your belief in your ability to cope is more important than your actual coping skills so you don't need to almost prove to yourself it's kind of perfectionist thinking which is why i think it links yeah. really nicely in this podcast you're kind of thinking well i'm never if i'm trying to get over my fear of i don't know spiders let's say I don't need to go and hold a tarantula to prove to myself that I'm over a, a fear of spiders. Okay. If I know, if I've got my skill set in the in my ability to cope with them, because I have rehearsed it and I've got those beliefs and those really calm thinking styles, and I can manage my emotions, it's that managing your emotions, as we know, all phobias are just a fear of fear itself, basically, and not being yeah. able to manage your emotions. So once I know I can do that, then it doesn't the, the situation kind of fades into insignificance because your skills are the same applied time and time again. Yeah. If that makes sense. So just like dealing with the left, death of a loved one and building a business seem poles apart, they seem they seem like two different skill sets you're going to need for those things. That's not the case at all. It's exactly yeah, the exactly. same skills. Yeah. 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 Brilliant. Fabulous. Okay, dope. Is there anything else that you would like to share or say while you are here on the podcast? Um... Yeah, I think the most important thing that we touched on today is, you know, get yourself to, to the point where you're thriving. 
Yes. Um, really work hard on that. You know, forget about your. I mean, it's important to focus on your metaphobia or the mental health symptoms a little bit. But focus on getting yourself thriving because that's yes. the easiest way to create great mental health and to yes. feel powerful and relaxed in all areas of your life, not just when you're yes. dealing with being sick or dealing with anxiety or whatever. So that's the most important thing for me to uh, kind of get across at this point. And also the perfectionist um, trade. Um, just let go of it. Work yeah. on, you know, getting over your perfectionism because it really, really holds you back in every yes. area of your life. Absolutely. So it's a very important thing to style to focus on and to get yeah. over. Yeah. So then why don't we end with that? Why don't we end with some tips on how to get over perfectionism? What does it look like? Because people who, maybe this is the first podcast that they've seen and they're Craig, and Craig, what's this program all about? And we're talking about perfectionist thinking. They might not know what that is or they might not understand that they have that. Now we know that perfectionist thinking is a key part of a metaphobia. So, yeah. you know, it's very, very relevant. But if you don't understand that you have that or what that look like, looks like, and that's just your habit of thinking, then it's going to be very hard to tackle. So do you want to talk about what perfectionist thinking looked like for yourself and then how you mm-hmm. tackled that? Yeah. So for me, what it looked like is um, finding the fault in everything, finding mistakes in everything, Always thinking that I wasn't good enough at doing something. So I remember actually going to the Thrive program. I remember as being perfectionist even back then. Yes. Because I was like, no, when once I get thriving, every single day will be lovely. And I will never create anxiety again. And I will, you know, be happy every single day. And that's just not really what life is. I mean, my life is amazing, but you know, I'm just I'm just a human being and you know, yes. not, life isn't perfect. So even those are examples where perfectionism sort of creeps in and um Especially in relation to metaphobia and anxiety, yeah. I was always like, if I create a bit of anxiety about something, that means I'm not over something. That means I'm not good enough. And um, it's real. It's, it's you know, for me, how I got over those things is um, being kind to myself. That's what I always say to people: don't be kind to yourself, be gentle with yourself, yeah. because being hard on yourself, it's, it's never helpful. It's only no. keep, it gets you stuck in those negative and limiting um, thoughts and, and belief systems. Yeah. So be kind to yourself and recognize that you are a perfectionist and really get it. It's not working. It's, yes. you know, it's never helpful to be a perfectionist no. and just being hard on yourself and creating lots of anxiety in the process where you're being yes. perfectionist. Yes. And if you would take those glasses off and if you stop being a perfectionist, you would see that, you know, you're probably actually doing a good job and you're actually... You might even be over, over your metaphobia and you didn't even know, like, like yeah, me. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, and it, is, it keeps you stopping from, from thriving and getting over your metaphobia. So. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And it can look very different to, to different people, but ultimately perfectionism is about setting ridiculously or very, very high standards for yourself and for others. Yeah. Um, and then always moving the goalposts. So, so high standards can be things like, you know, I, I've got to be on time to everything. And it can't be late, okay? Or and then getting cross at other people if they're late because you've got that high standard for yourself, and therefore everybody else should have that that standard. Yeah. Um, it can be, you know, I can't make typo mistakes in emails. You know, I've got to check and double check. Have I crossed crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's and make sure that I come across as ultra professional, one hundred percent all of the time. All of those things create anxiety and stress, and you're not allowing yourself yeah. to be perfectly imperfect and and make mistakes. But we all make mistakes. Yeah. You know, what I tend to, to say to clients is to go, well, if you don't allow yourself to be late, you say, no, you can't be late and other people can't be late. If your child or a child, let's say a five-year-old, seven-year-old child was tying their shoelaces for the first time and you were saying, okay, well, you're looking, going, mm, you're going to be late. Would you then say to them, right, stop, can't do that, got to be late, go. Okay. And every time, every time they were going somewhere, you go, you cannot be late. Make sure you're not late. You can't be late. If you did do that to them, that would create a lot of stress and a lot of anxiety. And they would start getting tense and going, oh, okay, okay, crikey. But it has the same impact on you. When you tell yourself you can't be late, you can't make a mistake in that email. You know, if they're learning to write or writing a letter to somebody and you're pointing out constantly everything that they've done wrong, you've missed a T there and you've, you've not put your capital letter there and this, that and the other. They're going to create stress. They're going to create anxiety. There's, there's pressure. And you're putting yeah. yourself under that pressure by being a perfectionist. And it's not helpful. It's completely unhelpful. There's nothing wrong with wanting to 
be good and wanting to be on time most of the yeah. time. Nothing wrong with that, having a preference for being on time. Nothing wrong for having a preference for not making typos. Nothing wrong with that at all. But if you create anxiety and stress when those things don't happen, when you make a typo or when you are late, then that's something that you need to work on. If you've got a preference yeah. for it, fine. But when it's anxiety, when it's driven by this, I can't because I, I can't bear the feeling that I create when I see that I've left a type or I can't bear the feeling that I create when I'm late to something, yeah. then it's something you need to work on. That's perfectionist thinking. Yeah. Yeah. So Absolutely. you can set yourself little challenges to to challenge your perfectionist thinking. For example, you could, if you're one of those people that I have to be on time, be a minute late to something on purpose and tolerate that discomfort. Okay. And then look at it and go, did anything bad happen? Was it that bad? Was it something that I needed to avoid? All that happened was I created an uncomfortable emotion about it, more than yeah. likely, unless you've got a really tyrant of a boss, okay, <laughs> if you're a minute late. Right? But all that happened was I had a really uncomfortable feeling I can manage my own emotions because that's all it is. It's managing your own emotions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. again, it, it kind of ties back to coping skills as well, coping mm -hmm. with the fact that you're not perfect, coping with the fact yes. that you might make mistakes. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And it's a, it's a key part of the program. It's very, very important to, yeah. one, understand that where you are being a perfectionist, where that thinking style is coming in, and two, start taking steps to tackle that and to challenge it. Yeah, sure. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Lovely. Well, thank you for joining us today. It's been amazing. Yes, it's been thank to have you. you. Thank you. <laughs>